Hey, welcome again to Vintage Church. If I've never met you before, my name is Dustin Turner, and I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church. Today, we are kicking off our series, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. If you were with us in 2019, we began this series through the book of Hebrews, and over the summer, we are going to wrap up this book. And this entire book is all about Can't Stop, won't stop. The book of Hebrews was a letter and a sermon written to a group of Christians who came from a Jewish background, and they were experiencing some form of persecution for following Jesus. And so what they began to think about is, what would it be like if we went back from our Christianity to Judaism, that perhaps it would be easier and better to go back to Judaism and leave Jesus. And so this entire book is written with the encouragement and the challenge that we can't stop and that we won't stop. I want to encourage you, if you need to catch up on any of these sermons from last year, or you want to go and look for some more resources related to this series, check out our new website, vcmvmt.com. Today, we're going to be in Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 14. If you have a Bible, turn there, open it up on your phone. The words are also going to be on the screen. But as we Get ready to read God's Word. I want you to think about something. How many of you have ever been in a point in your life where you've wanted to meet someone, you've wanted to get to know somebody, but you didn't have any sort of connection to that person? I think about it in my own life, uh, the New Orleans Saints, our beloved New Orleans Saints. There were people on the team that I would have loved to have met And that just in and of myself, I wasn't able to get to them because I didn't know them. But our founding pastor, Pastor Rob Wilton, is the New Orleans Saints chaplain. And because of his relationship, I was able to connect relationally and meet those players. Now, now here's the reality, right? Many of us might be trying to approach or get to certain people, but here's what I want you to think about. In a similar vein, many of us are trying to get to God, but we are searching blindly, looking in all of the wrong places. And today, what we're going to see in Hebrews 9 is the author is going to tell us how, or better yet, who are we going to go through so we can get to God. And so let's look at Hebrews 9, starting in verse 1. Here's what the author says. He says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. In which, was, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. I know that's a ton of stuff, a ton of information. You're like, what in the world's going on? Stay with me. Verse 6. These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes. And he, but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, 
He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now listen, there's a ton of stuff in this passage that's difficult for us to wrap our minds around. Don't forget the original audience. The original audience were Jewish Christians, and everything in these 14 verses is about the tabernacle and about all of the sacrifices, things they would have been very familiar with. And so part of what we have to do today is unpack this and what does it mean for us. And in order to do that, I want to make some comparisons between what the author talks about, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Here's the first comparison. The old was earthly, the new is heavenly. Now, in order to talk about the covenant, we first have to define what the covenant is. So what is the first covenant? Covenant. One author uh, defines covenant like this. It's a solemn commitment guaranteeing promises or obligations undertaken by one or both parties, sealed with an oath. It is a commitment between two parties. And with that commitment are obligations that they are holding up on each side. We see this play out in the book of Exodus. In Exodus 19 verses 3 through 7, God explains the covenant that he wants to make with the people of Israel. Look at what he tells Moses. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob or the people of Israel, you yourselves, verse 4, have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded. God was making a commitment to the people of Israel. He said, listen, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, and I'm going to bring you in to the promised land, and you are going to be my people. But listen, for the people of Israel, they have a commitment. They're to do all that the Lord said. They were to follow His rules. It was a covenant, And in Exodus 19, we learn about this old covenant that is the example in Hebrews 9. And so part of what the author of Hebrews is getting at is what worship looked like under the old covenant. There was a tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place where the presence of God dwelt. And only the priests could enter in to the tabernacle. The first room that the author of Hebrews talks about was called the holy place. And inside the holy place were things like the lampstand, the table and bread of presence, the altar of incense. And it was the priest's response responsibility to go into the holy place and minister. That's where they worshiped the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel. But the author of Hebrews refers not just to the holy place, but the most holy place. And inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. That's that box that if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, you know what I'm talking about, right? With the cherubim on top, and inside the box was the Ten Commandments, amongst other things. And on the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat, and that was where the presence of God in the tabernacle amongst the people dwelt. And what he gets at is he says the high priest was the only one who could enter into the most holy place. And it was only on the Day of Atonement. If you want to learn about the Day of Atonement, look at Leviticus 16. 
It was only on the Day of Atonement, the day when the high priest made a sacrifice for the sins of the people, it was only on that day that only the high priest could enter into that room. And so all of this explains worship under this old covenant. And so the second question for us to think about when we compare these two covenants is then, why is the new covenant heavenly? In Hebrews 9, one of the things that it compares is the earthly covenant, this earthly tabernacle, to Jesus being in heaven in this heavenly tabernacle, with this heavenly covenant. And part of what the author is getting at is that the earthly tabernacle foreshadows the heavenly tabernacle. Now, there's not a literal tabernacle in heaven. What's the point of that reference, of that image? Who dwelt in the tabernacle on earth? God. Who dwells in heaven? God. And so the point that the author is making is that God's presence dwells in heaven where this heavenly tabernacle is and Christ has gone to heaven. His death gives us access to God in heaven. It's because of Jesus going to the cross, dying for our sins, resurrecting from the dead, and ascending to heaven that we are able to have access to God. And that's every single person who is in Christ. Remember, who had access to God with the earthly covenant? Only the priest, and ultimately only the high priest. But because of Jesus, we all have access to God. And so in comparing these two, the first thing that we see is that the old was earthly and the new is heavenly. But it's not just that that old covenant was earthly and the new was heavenly. The author also gets at this reality. The old was imperfect and the new is perfect. Look at what he says in verse 7. It says, into the second, that's the most holy place, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year. Now I want you to catch what he says next. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself. Now why does the high priest have to offer a sacrifice or bring blood on his own behalf? Because the high priest is a broken, sinful human like the rest of the people of Israel. And so the old was imperfect because the one offering the sacrifice was imperfect. What it teaches us, what it reminds us, is that even for the high priest and even for you and I, our sin separates us from God. There's nothing that we can do in and of our own power to bring us back into the presence of God. Now look at verse 12. Again, this comparison. The old was imperfect, but the new is what? Perfect. Look at verse 12. He entered, he's talking about Jesus now, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of what? His own blood. Now, what the author is getting at is he's getting at who Jesus is. He's getting at the person of Christ. Who is Jesus? He's not only fully human, but at the same time, he's fully God. He's fully human, so he's able to represent us before God perfectly. But at the same time, he's fully God, and so he's perfect. His sacrifice on our behalf works. That's why the new is perfect. The new is perfect because he's perfect. And part of what the the author of Hebrews is getting at is like, listen, why do you want to go back to the old? The old is imperfect. The new is perfect. Recently, our AC broke in our house. And you know, it's starting to get blazing hot out. We would keep it almost as low as we could, and the temperature wouldn't get below 75. Well, come to find out, the refrigerant was out. There was a leak on our AC. And there literally came a day where it wasn't working at all. And we were just like, forget it. Why are we going to keep the air conditioner running when it's not lowering the temperature? 
Why would we go back to the imperfect when we can have the perfect? So what did we do? We called an AC HVAC repairman and made it perfect again. Why would we go back to the imperfect when we can have the perfect? The old was imperfect. The new is perfect. Thirdly, part of what makes the old imperfect and the new perfect is that the old was continuous and the new is eternal. The old was continuous, the new is eternal. Look again, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to point out some key words to you in in these two verses. Verses 6 through 7 talk about the old covenant, the old sacrifices. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go how often? Regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year. So literally, the priests are going into the holy place on a regular, consistent basis. And the high priest is going into the most holy place on a regular one-year basis. Every year, on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter into the most holy place and make a sacrifice to remove the sins of the people. So why were the old covenant sacrifices continual? Why do you have to do the same thing over and over and over again? Because they don't work. The point of the priests going into the holy places and the high priest going into the most holy place regularly was because they had to keep offering the sacrifices because the sin kept piling up. The sacrifices weren't removing the sin. Something needed to be done. The continuous sacrifices in the Old Covenant demonstrate our need for true forgiveness. Now compare that to the new. Look at verses 11 through 12 when he's talking about Jesus. The author says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Look at verse 12. He entered once for all. Not regularly, not once a year, once for all into the holy places. The difference is the work of Christ. The new covenant sacrifice is eternal. Why did he only have to enter once and for all? Because that sacrifice worked. It didn't have to be repeated over and over and over again. And as I've already said, as a human, Jesus was able to perfectly represent us. Because as we are human, he is human. He's able to be a sacrifice on our behalf. But at the same time, as God, he was the perfect sacrifice it wasn't the blood of goats and other animals that we were trying to use to take care of our sins it was the blood of a perfect human that was able to take care of our sins and now because of christ's once and for all sacrifice we can have access to god eternally That's part of what the author of Hebrews is getting at in chapter 9. Is Listen, all of you want to get to God. You want to find a way to get to your Creator. But going back to the old, going back to the imperfect, going back to the continual sacrifices and that covenant that just keeps repeating itself, it's not going to work. It's not going to get you to God. It's only the new, the perfect, the eternal, that's going to get you to God. I think the most important comparison that we see in Hebrews chapter 9 is this. The old was physical, but the new is spiritual. Look at what the author says at the end of verse 9 into verse 10 about the old being just physical. He says this, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered, look at what he says, that cannot perfect the conscience. There's something it can't do. 
It cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but it deals only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation. Now look at, I want you to, I want to give you some definitions here. What's the conscience? What does it mean when it refers to the conscience in Hebrews chapter 9? One commentator explains the conscience like this. The conscience is the human organ of the religious life embracing the whole person in relationship to God. Look at what he says next. It is the point at which a person confronts God's holiness. And the reason it's that point at which a person confronts God's holiness is because when you, an imperfect, broken, sinful human being, are approaching a perfect, holy, majestic God, you recognize that your sin, there's something separating you with God. The old cannot cleanse, cannot perfect the conscience. This idea of perfecting, he's ultimately getting at the idea of forgiveness of sin. There's two ideas, two big theological words. First, expiation. That word simply means removal or cleansing of sin. And so part of what has to happen in order for us to gain access to God is that our sin is removed. That was the entire point of the Old Testament sacrificial system, that the sins would be removed, but they were never able to be removed with animal sacrifices. But So expiation, but then there's propitiation. Propitiation is not the removal of sin, but it's a, it's a result of the removal of sin. Because your sin is removed, the wrath of God is then removed. That's propitiation. And so what he's getting at is this idea, our consciences are perfected before a holy God because our sin is removed and God's wrath against us is removed. Here's what I want you to get, because this is so important. What separates us from God is not our physical impurity. What separates us from God is not our physical impurity, but our spiritual impurity. It's like this. If you had a gaping wound on your body, would you try to fix it with a Band-Aid? No. Because a Band-Aid's not going to do it. You're going to bleed out, right? That Band-Aid's not going to close that wound up. So why would we go back and try to use something, try to do something that's not going to take care of our spiritual problem before God? Now, look at the comparison. Look at this spiritual element in verses 13 and 14. He's talking about the work of Christ again. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, if all they are meant to do is do something with the physical, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, do what? Look at the end of verse 14. Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you see the comparison that the author is making? Part of what he's getting at is why do our consciences in the first place, per, first place need to be purified? Because he's reminding the audience, and it's understood, they, they knew who God was, this, this audience that read this letter, that God was a perfect, holy being, that he couldn't uh, mingle with sin. So our consciences need to be purified because God is holy, but at the same time, we were created to be in relationship with God. That's Genesis 1 and 2. God created us to be in relationship with him. But we are sinful people and our sin separates us from God. Therefore, our consciences need to be perfected. They need to be purified. 
Our sin must be removed. And when our sin is removed, we've just talked about this, God's wrath and our guilt are removed. And then we can be in relationship with God. And everything that's going on in Hebrews chapter 9, undergirding Hebrews chapter 9, is the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, died for our sins. Because he was a perfect sacrifice, his sacrifice on the cross paid not only for our sins, but the penalty for our sins. And because he resurrected from the grave, he defeated sin, death, and hell. And so now, all of these other things are not needed. His sacrifice was once and for all. We're now cleansed from our sin. The Bible says when we respond to the gospel, our response is twofold. Repentance, turning away from the way that we have been living, our life of sin, separated from God, turning away from our sin. And then number two, faith, placing our trust in the work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when we repent and we believe, we will be saved. Lately, I don't know about you, I don't know how many of you have been on a Zoom call in the global pandemic, right? Maybe some of you if, you, if you've been on a, uh, a Zoom call, just raise your hand in your living room. If you've been on a hundred Zoom calls over the last couple of months, raise your hand. And there's something I want you to think about related to the Zoom call. If you've been on a Zoom call, you know that you need access to join a conversation. You need that meeting ID and that meeting password. Otherwise, you can't get on to that conversation. And what I want you to see from Hebrews 9 today is that's exactly what the author is talking about. I think the reality is is that we're all looking for access and the most significant relationship we need access to is God. And for many of us, we might not be of Jewish background, and so we're not going back to the Old Testament law and being a good Jew, but we're searching in every other conceivable place. And what the author of Hebrews is getting at is this truth. Through his sacrifice, Jesus cleanses our guilty consciences, giving us the ability to approach God. What I want you to see today is you don't have to keep looking all over the place for God. You have found God when you found Jesus. And the only way to get to God, the only way to have access to God is through Jesus. And so what the author of Hebrews wants us to know is that we've got to to turn to Jesus. We have to trust Jesus. Jesus, that Jesus is the way to the Father. He's the way to God. He's the one who provides us access. And so the last question for you and I is, do you want to know God? Then there's only one place you look. You look to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Father, that you have provided a way for us to come to you. God, I'm thankful that we don't have to provide all of these different sacrifices, but Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins. He died on behalf of us. And so today, God, I pray that we would quit looking everywhere else and we would simply look to Jesus. That we would find you in Jesus. And so help us now as we respond to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.